and welcome to the Texas System of Care Cultural and Linguistic Competence Podcast. My name is Shannon Moreno, and I'm the CLC or Cultural and Linguistic Competence Specialist with Texas System of Care. This podcast is devoted towards how to work with specific populations within your local system of care community and ensure that you're providing services that are culturally and linguistically appropriate. This series is focused on working with the Latino community. For a further explanation of CLC terminology, including terms used in this podcast, we recommend checking out the ABCs of CLC webinar series. Today, we continue the conversation with Dr. Manuel Zamarripa, Professor of Counseling at South University in Round Rock, Texas. I think that we've had some really, really great conversations here. Um, I was wondering before when we were talking about linear and circular communication mm-hmm. style, because um, we did talk about that quite a bit, but I was wondering, because um, I think some folks, when they hear about circular communication style, if they see like a, a model or a diagram, you know, they kind of know what mm-hmm. we're talking about there. Um, but it's another thing to actually kind of hear it and, and what it sounds like, and especially if you were just raised with linear all mm-hmm. the time, you right. know, never had any relatives or friends who spoke circular. Um, it can sound very different, and in the context of a provider, it could even be something that someone may think that that this is a symptom of a mental health mm-hmm. concern rather right. than just the way that someone talks because it's it's a cultural pattern of speech. Can you talk mm-hmm. a little bit more specifically about circular communication? Yeah, I mean, there are several ways that that can come up, and the thing that probably is the most noticeable is the use of stories yeah uh, personal stories of what's happened to me or what's happened in my family you know if I were the client that may or may not seem to be answering the question of the provider mm-hmm. right so um, asking a question about background or about the symptoms and then saying oh you know I had an uncle that you know they did this and this and that and and this happened to him and then uh, he went away, and the outcome of the story has nothing to do a lot of the times with the question. Because the circular communication sometimes, it's not about the the accurate communication where you're going to follow the plot in a linear direction. And so you're thinking, okay, this guy is telling me a story that's going to be related to the question. Uh, let, me, let me listen. And then it ends up, and the story ends, where it doesn't seem to be connected to the question at all. But it's the it's the feeling that the story evokes a lot of the time about how the uncle is feeling or how people reacted to what was happening with the uncle uh, that's going to be the closest connection to what the question evoked for the client, mm-hmm. right? So again, yeah, it's not a direct back and forth, but it's kind of, <laughs> it's I hesitate to say, it's kind of the way a lot of uh, commercials are today about products, <laughs> Have you noticed over the last 10 or 15 years, the more expensive a commercial is and the more the product they're trying to sell to you in a commercial has nothing to do with the product Mm -hmm. at all. And sometimes it purposefully makes no sense, (laughs) right? So how are they selling a product? Well, they've done very well. They've done the psychological research, right? They're evoking a feeling. Mm -hmm. And they know that that's enough for the population to buy the product or to intuitively and even concretely understand. They're trying to find a way to personally connect to their audience to buy their product. And the way they do that is not talk about the product. Mm -hmm. You talk about what it does for you in your life. You talk about how you're living a meaningful life if you buy this, but they don't say that directly. They just show you the emotion, right? Mm -hmm. So in some ways, interestingly enough, that's a kind of notion of circular communication when clients are giving you stories that may seem delusional, they may seem not based in reality, maybe, that may seem mythical, or that may not follow a linear pattern uh, in its outcome mm-hmm. that you're waiting for, because you're waiting for a response. You have to look at the, the intent, uh, uh, the emotion, the feeling, the characters in the story, the other people in the story, how they're responding or reacting. And if they're responding and reacting in a way that's opposite of what you're expecting, then the client may be saying, I disagree with you. It's, mm-hmm. it's not that important. You know. Now, the client may or may not be right. Yeah. That's a different level. Like The client may or may not want to admit what he or she is going through. You know, uh, Or the provider could be wrong. 
But the point that we're talking about here is yeah. the way they get that across. So in in their communication, um, you're looking for the connection to what you're asking. And usually they're trying to give you an example. They're trying to illuminate some aspect of that. And uh, and again, if the if in the story people are reacting in a way that's opposite, you know, the message could be not so much for me and my family. You know, that really doesn't happen that much. I disagree. And again, with that awareness of that communication approach, <coughs> you know, someone might be working with a youth and a, and a grandmother, let's yeah. say, um, who does utilize circular communication and may make the mistake of thinking that her cognitive capacities are not 100% when right. that's not what is going on at all. Right. She's communicating differently. And so, yeah. you know, uh, first of all, there might be the issue of not the provider not being able to read between the lines, like what you're describing, of understanding what the point of the story is, what are the emotions that are being conveyed by by the story. Mm -hmm. And then second of all, there, you know, could potentially be, I I think, at least in my experience, anecdotally, please, you know, correct me if you've seen differently, particularly with older, Generations, there there can be the mistake of a misdiagnosis. Yeah. Um, if that's the primary client, or even if it's just a family member of a primary client that that person's not necessarily diagnosing, they may um, put aside or discount much of what that individual says because they assume that it's again that cognitive capacity right. issue, where you know that that grandmother um, may may not be having any any of those issues going uh-huh. on. Um, so I, th- I think that's in, incredibly important. What advice would you have for, again, folks who are very much linear, not only in their own personal style, but you know, growing up and through their professional career, they've really mostly been exposed to linear communication. How do you get, can you say like fluent yeah. <laughs> in circular right. communication, or how do you learn to read between those lines? I think one of the things is making our individualistic ways of seeing things and concepts, making them more visible to us and then stepping outside of them. Okay, so specifically, we focus on the individual a lot. We focus on a lot of I. We focus on the general take-it-for-granted assumption of mental health is a lot of selves, self-awareness, self-concept, self-esteem. And we're like, that's not culturally valued that's just is wrong (laughs) that's a cultural value that focuses on the individual we don't talk about relational esteem Mm -hmm. we don't talk about relational concept we don't talk about relational awareness there's a whole other side of our existence as human beings that we have just just omitted in terms of mental health and psychiatry and 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 there are no relational diagnoses in the dsm Right. right it's all assumed to come from the individual right and if it is relational then it's not a real diagnosis right so okay right right exactly so being aware of that okay understanding that helps us because then if we open ourselves up then we can maybe abandon some of the rules about what's healthy communication in the therapy room i think i may have mentioned this before is that with a lot of Latino clients and just, you know, a lot of clients in general in terms of not assuming, but here talking about Latino clients um, is I rarely use I statements because mm-hmm. I think that's a cultural imposition uh, or it can be. Mm-hmm. For some people, it's very helpful because they need to focus on uh, how they're feeling and what's going on. But for some people, it can be a cultural imposition. Um, to force a way of communication. So, for example, people will say, well, my mom really has a problem. She's giving me a hard time about that. And I don't think it's a problem at all. And then uh, we're talking to the client and saying, well, you know, what would you like to do? Uh, what do you? How do you feel about it? Well, I don't know, but uh, my mom has a hard time with it, or my dad does, or my sister's giving me a hard time, my friends give me a hard time. The individualistic perspective would say, the linear perspective would say, well, I can't really help them. I'm talking to you. Right. Okay. I always cringe when I hear that mm. I, because there's no checking in to see if that's an appropriate worldview for that person. And it's a, it's a, it's a cultural imposition 
and it's kind of teaching clients how they should behave as clients when there's no way to behave as a client. They're people, you know, it's our job to meet them where they're at. Mm -hmm. So I might engage in what you're not supposed to engage in, which is talking about the other people that aren't in the room, you know, because uh, I think we can't help the client that way. So wh what? why do you think your mom doesn't like it? You know, what is it that she has a problem with and uh, how come your friends think it's fine you know and why do you want to you know believe them and what would your uh, uh, what would your mom say if if you did this and you acted in this way um, because whatever answer the client gives you we know that the mom's not there and the friend isn't there so whatever answer the client gives you is part of what they're thinking right. it's part of what they're thinking and what they're feeling and there's no need for me to tear down that wall so that they can tell me that they have to say it in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And I've heard you um, talk before about how um, our system is just so individually focused. And mm -hmm. that I, I think we've talked today a lot about in regards to engagement on only paying attention to the individual, not, not paying attention to the family as a whole and even generations in the past, but um, I think something you just brought up as well is even um, actual treatment approaches and, and what is out there as kind of the standard go-to, you know, the golden star textbook um, way of approaching things. And a lot of times, unfortunately, those approaches were, again, not developed with specific populations, you right. know, being accounted for or when, when they were tested with different pilot groups and all of that, it, it you know, does tend to be almost Caucasian, Euro European Americans. Right. Um, and pieces of that may be beneficial. Other pieces right. you really do, have, as a provider, have to know who you're working with and whether or not that's going to be, be appropriate um, uh -huh. for, for that particular person, for their family as well. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely important, that piece. I hope you enjoyed today's CLC podcast on working with the Latino community. If you have any questions on how to bring CLC initiatives into your local system of care community, please feel free to email us at info at txsystemofcare.org.